Welcome, dear readers. You're listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast book club. We are recording today in the forest of knowledge that is the Millennium Library, which is in Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, and Dakota, as well as the birthplace of the Métis Nation and the heart of the Métis homeland. Our life-giving drinking water comes from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation in Treaty 3 territory. In this episode, we will be discussing A Stranger in the Woods, The Extraordinary Story of the Last True Hermit by Michael Finkel. I'm Dennis from the Idea Mill, and my favorite spot to hide from the world is in my shower. (laughs) Across the table from me is... Oh, my name's Kirsten, and you'll find me at the Harvey Smith Library, and my favorite place to hide from the world is in a book. Is that too on the nose? (laughs) (laughs) I'll accept it. But across the table from me is... Hi, I'm Trevor Lockhart, and I'm speaking to you from my homemade shelter made entirely out of James Patterson cast-offs from the (laughs) Louis Rail Library. (laughs) Across the table from me is... Hi, I'm Erica Ball. I'm uh, the branch head at Fort Gary Library, and my my favorite place to hide is any place that is cushiony, next to a window, and with a blanket. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> 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 Sounds good right up now. <laughs> yes. A good book can carry me away from an ever ancient old and And you, dear readers, we couldn't do this without you. Your questions and comments fill us with joy beyond measure because they add so much to our discussions. You can find our email address and all of our social media outlets by going to wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca and scrolling to the bottom of the page. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to Time to Read on your favorite podcasting service. And be sure to stick around for our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. In a minute, Erica is going to summarize this month's book, but first, Kirsten will give us a bio of the author. Okie dokie, doggy daddy. Michael Finkel is an American journalist and memoirist. He knew from the age of 10 that he wanted to be a writer. When he graduated college in 1990, he got a job with Skiing Magazine and was able to ski all over the world. Iran, glaciers of Mount Kilimanjaro, sweet job. (laughs) Then he started to write for the New York Times until 2002, when he was fired for a story about the Arabic slave trade within Africa that profiled a boy who was actually a composite of several boys he had interviewed. There were lots and lots of articles that I read that called Michael Finkel the disgraced journalist. Mm -hmm. He, however, refers to himself when he's talking to Christopher Knight in the book, he calls himself a flawed journalist. The day after his firing was made public, Finkel learned that a Michigan man named Christian Longo, who had murdered his wife and three children, was telling people he worked for the New York Times and was using the name Michael Finkel as an alias during his several weeks as a fugitive. Longo was captured the next month and Finkel reached out to him. He wrote him a letter while he was being held in jail in Oregon, Mm. which sounds very familiar. Mm -hmm. Uh, Similar M.O., And uh, Finkel ended up writing a memoir about his subsequent relationship with Longo, where after his conviction, Longo actually told uh, Finkel all about his guilt. And that memoir was called True Story, Murder Memoir, Mea Culpa. In 2015, the memoir was turned into a movie starring Jonah Hill as Finkel and James Franco as Longo. Did you guys know about this? No. no. What? Okay. I did not know either. Okay, good. Because I thought maybe I just... Anyway, Finkel has reported from more than 50 countries across six continents, covering topics ranging from the world's last hunter-gatherer tribes to conflicts in Afghanistan and Israel to the international black market in human organs to theoretical physics. His work has appeared in National Geographic, GQ, The Atlantic, Esquire, Rolling Stone, and Vanity Fair. He says he's never specialized in one topic in his writing career, obviously. He just writes stories that grab his interest or who answer his letter from jail. (laughs) (laughs) His routine for writing is that he has no routine and just that when he's in full on writing mode, he writes all night. So that is Michael Finkel, and I really want to talk more about some of that stuff that, you know, Mm -hmm. with Mm -hmm. Christian Longo and as we talk about this book, because it actually affected a little bit how I thought about the book Mm -hmm. afterwards when I learned this stuff. Anyway, Mm -hmm. over to you, Erica. Thank you, Kirsten. 
Uh, so this summary is mostly by me, but with a couple of lines lifted from the book summary, the official one, because I like them. Is it actually possible to live a solitary life without relying on anyone else, without relying on modern society at all? This is just one of the questions journalist Michael Finkel explores in the life of Christopher Knight, who lived alone in the woods of Maine for 27 years. Though in that time he had no contact or conversation with another person, he lived in a tent and survived off food, books, and provisions stolen from nearby cottages, greatly affecting the people who owned them. Why did this shy young man depart on such a life? How else could he have lived the life he craved, if not at the expense of others? Based on extensive interviews with Knight himself, this is a vividly detailed account of his secluded life. Many people dream of escaping modern life, but most will never act on it. So what did we think of the story overall? I thought it was fascinating. Yeah. It was a very good pick for just, I think, how many of us are feeling right now in the last few weeks and months uh, since the uh, pandemic settled in and we've been rethinking a lot of our routines and our relationships and things. I, I uh, yeah, I found it very interesting and would like to hear what everyone else had to say, think about it too. And really readable too. Like yeah. it was, yeah. And put downable, as <laughs> Erica might say. It really I mean, was. it really was. <laughs> and that's, I, you can re rely on journalists for that. Like if you, if you see a book like this and it's written by a journalist, then you know that they're going to weave a good yarn rather than if it's like a scientist or, you know, I'm sorry, academics, but, you yeah, know, it's true. Know. It's, it's a, a different type of writing. He, it, it won me over in the very first few pages where it only mentions L.L. Bean, uh, <laughs> uh, but also there's quite a bit of wristwatch chat. Oh, uh, <laughs> so, so I was like, I'm fully in for this story now. It, it kind of, uh, yeah, it hooks into uh, me speaking early. Speaking to you. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I found it fascinating. I mean, I have had that thought many times of how do you get away from everything. Yeah. And I could never figure out a practical way to do it because you always need to have stuff somehow, like uh, unless you're like a trapper or hunter in a really remote area of the world, how can you get away from everybody? Right. How can you do it and still supply yourself with food and uh, shelter and everything else? And uh, so I never proceeded with anything because how could I? I Because I guess you would never steal. Well, there is the crux of a lot of, you know, my thoughts about his lifestyle living mm -hmm. on his own, right? It sounds great, except mm -hmm. yeah. for what you actually have to do. Well, what's interesting, too, is like Christopher Knight as a character, he came across as someone who has a very strict moral code, mm -hmm. uh, very strict ideas about how one should live one's life. And he stuck to all of them except one. Mm -hmm. And it's like when he broke that one. It's like, well, okay, I can keep breaking that yeah. one, but I won't break any of the others yeah. is kind of how it felt. And when he was caught, I mean, mm -hmm. he was like, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. I did this. I yeah. need to be punished. You know, the, the yeah. interesting flip side of that is if you look at it through a lens of privilege. Yeah. And we're talking about mm -hmm. his like ability to survive versus the fear that the people who, you know, want to enjoy their second homes is feeling. And if you kind of think of it in terms of where are we putting the weight? Like in the book, Michael Finkel does stress a lot how, I think he uses the word terrorized, um, the people in these cottages feel, and I feel for them. But on the other hand, their feeling of safety in their second homes, while important, may not be the most important thing to focus on when you're talking about these issues well, you see what i'm getting at yeah oh yeah true mm -hmm. yeah although in his particular situation he didn't have to be in the woods doing this he had a job he had a support system he had a family yeah he had options and like some people don't have as many options that because mm. it's like saying you know if if people really feel like they need like who they are and they need to live a certain kind of life and there isn't a good way for them to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, what is it an option? Or are you trapped? Like, do you have to live in a city? Do you, or do you have to live in a house? If you prefer sleeping rough, how do you do that? And still, you know, and not end up having to break laws or something like that. Because, you know, there's lots of ways of living. That so, is true. Yeah. And but, Finkel does talk about sort of 
biology a little bit at the beginning, mm. you know, where he talks about the low levels of Oxycontin and high levels of something else and then bringing it together and it makes for a very sort of unsociable or person who just really does yeah. not want social interaction, does not feel comfortable with that, is not able to make do social bonding and because he didn't have a plan, like he didn't plan to do this, no. right? No, he it's, went it's on a, a holiday to Florida yeah. and then he was coming back and then kind of just drove by his house. Yeah. And kept driving. Yeah. Right. And haven't we all had that <laughs> desire? Just keep on driving. Yeah. <laughs> I have a an idea about that that formed in my head as I was like I listened to the audiobook and as I was listening to the story and I was trying to think of like, you know, the motivation to literally hide away from everyone else. But I kind of felt like like he didn't have a plan when he went into the woods. Mm. I on some level and maybe not consciously, because, you know, as I mentioned, he seemed to have a very strict code about how he should live. On some level, I think he wanted to die. Mm. And I think he mm -hmm. expected to die yeah. because he did not prepare. Yeah. You can plan ahead. But, yeah. But the thing is, point. he also, when he went out in the woods, you know, he, he was probably starving like for those first couple of weeks before he finally started stealing some from the gardens and, and that kind of thing. I also think his way of thinking about the world also wouldn't allow him to actually commit suicide yeah. or to consciously even think of it like that. So he had to try to live. Sort of like passively commit suicide. Like yeah. if it happens. He mm -hmm. put himself in the worst possible situation, yeah. isolated from everybody with no access to anything. And then just sort of see what would happen. And then he just, but he, he was too successful, yeah. you know, and he, yeah. so he lived. He lived. But I don't, I don't know. That's like. That's but, a very but interesting. Also the bizarre thing about his isolation was that he was like minutes away from yeah. lots like, of things. You know, he could hear people on the lake, their motorboats in the summer, yeah. and he could like. So, to me, like towards the end of the book, you know, the first part was focused on on Christopher Knight, and then towards the end, Michael Finkel started to look at the other people that were affected by, it. like you said, the cottagers yeah. and. And, and it was, even though I had read the, the book and I was sort of, you know, well, where I started to almost side with some of the cottagers where they were like, there's mm -hmm. no way he could have done that. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. like for 27 years. Like even no though, fire, not, yeah. he never had a fire. I mean, I, yeah. I know when they went to excavate his campsite, they found all of the, like the, the refuge and mm -hmm. like refuse and all, all, like, all like evidence yeah. of him living there. But despite that, like it just, it does, it doesn't, it doesn't fit into what we think is reasonably possible to yeah. live for 27 years yeah. mm -hmm. within uh, a mile or less of, yeah. you know, I, but I, that's I, the extraordinary -ness of it all, it's right? Like, well, yeah. The most extraordinary part too is because he didn't want to leave tracks on the snow. Yeah. How he basically stayed within his camp yeah. all winter long, mm -hmm. basically only able to move within that camp. And, uh, you know, when he described like, you know, he had to be disciplined about it. He had to get up really early in the morning and just walk constantly in a circle. Because if he had stayed laying down that whole time, he would, he have, would died. have died. You can't yeah. survive like that. It's such a monotonous, determined kind of thing. You know, I don't think most people could do that. No. Even remotely. I don't think most people would have survived the first winter. No. But he was a particular type of resourceful and tough individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I like, because what you were saying, you know, he didn't have the plan and, or maybe his plan was somehow to just go into the woods mm -hmm. and die. But then as the years went on and became more and more successful and more disciplined and more, and then, you know, by the end of the book, um, you know, he's telling Finkel that he considers himself this Nietzschean ubermensch, this superhuman. I mean, and, but that's after like 27 mm -hmm. years of lots of reading and, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, ex exploring like and, and spending all that time of just sitting and maybe contemplating his life. And then he sees that his life has had some sort of purpose mm -hmm. um, and that's to become this mm -hmm. How did, how, did I, how did I do this? He didn't. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any goal or any, you know, passion it's, before. It's, it's almost a little bit like you know, if you if you meet somebody new and you're introduced, but then you their name doesn't stick with you, and then then you meet them a second time and a third time, and then by the, the fourth time, you're like, oh, I, I can't ask them what their name is, <laughs> uh, and so you just kind of 
play along. It's almost like maybe there were times where he was like, I, I need to go, but like, well, you know what? It's already been 12 years. I can't, I don't have, a, yeah. I don't have an exit strategy at this point. Yeah. Or something. I mean, yeah. uh, he did try sleeping inside one night, right? Yeah. And he, but he couldn't sleep because he was just so worried. Well, that he'd be caught. caught. So that, yeah. so he tried that. So he's outside and the whole thing too, that struck me again is being like, he never like medical attention, like, you know, yeah. he, he never once like sprained his ankle got or an infection or got an infection. I mean, I guess the, the way he was explaining was infections come from other people mm, yeah. and he's out there. But I, I mean, again, like, I mean, <laughs> the fact that Michael Finkel was sort of discredited as somebody that made stuff up also played <laughs> into it a bit with me too. Thing like, like is he an unreliable narrator mm. but for a non in a nonfiction sense too like there's mm -hmm. he, well, I mean, he's clean about it. he comes clean about it he says in the book how he was discredited right like he well, talks about it he says yes i'm a flawed journalist yeah, about and, how he's but, the opposite. I, but i but even at, like at, read over that sorry sorry but at, at the same time like i w had kind of similar questions so i looked up to see if there were other articles about christopher knight and there were including mm -hmm. photographs of knight and photographs of his campsite yes, mm -hmm. I which looked was, it up too. Which was yeah. bigger than i thought mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't know if there were uh, photographs in the book because I was listening to the audio book, no, but uh, yeah, there were some photographs of the site and it was a lot more spacious than I expected yeah. based on this description of being behind a rock and, uh, right. you know, in this tight little area. Yeah. Like I really, I had to look it up because I mm -hmm. just, I couldn't envision it, especially mm -hmm. with like the cabins being five minutes away or, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah, within hearing distance and he could hear people walking by sometimes. Right. Yeah. Well, the other thing, too, is because he was so isolated, like when you're in a quiet environment, you do pick up noise from farther away. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I can imagine being able to hear people and they're still way too far away to see you right. or hear you because they're in their homes listening yeah. to the radio or watching TV or talking to other people. Speaking of talking to other people, uh, <laughs> one of the questions we asked on social media was, how long have you gone without speaking to another person? Yeah, and uh, our uh, Facebook page, uh, Christy said she thinks she's spoken with somebody every day of her life, mm -hmm. which I think, God, me, it was probably would be only more than a few hours I've gone without talking to somebody. I don't think I've ever been more than a day for me. Regan also wrote in to say that <laughs> it was two days, but she says also that it wasn't long enough. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's funny because Aaron underscore 13 underscore M on Instagram also said not long enough, <laughs> LOL. But Headingley Library said a weekend and it was bliss. Mm. Um, I don't know. I think I might be like Christy. I think maybe I like for an entire day, mm -hmm. like even when I was on the Camino and walking by myself, I still yeah. spoke to people. Like I was thinking like if I was on like an international flight, I'd be sleeping, but I'd still be talking. Like, you, yeah, you have, still, yeah. There's interactions with yeah. people. I think in my early 20s when I was uh, living alone, I might occasionally have gone more than a day without speaking to someone. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't have any recollection of that. I was really depressed back then, which is one of the reasons I wouldn't speak to anyone. Right. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. uh, you know, since uh, like the last couple of decades, I know I haven't gone more than a day because, you know, just that's my life. Yeah. And I know like, you know, lots of us have said, oh, not long enough, you know, but I wonder if we were put in that situation, would we really want it like well, i will say the closest i've had to extended non-contact was uh, i had a friend who lived up in Yellowknife, and i drove out there once which uh was either a two-day or a three-day drive depending mm -hmm. on how long how much i was pushing myself and on those trips i only spoke to like gas station attendants and uh the person at the motel check-in desk mm -hmm. you know so perfunctory exchanges and i didn't mind that at all yeah. and my my truck had a Cassette player, mm -hmm. and I had one cassette. <laughs> I became very familiar with Doug and the Slugs' Tomcat Prowl <laughs> oh album. <my> <laughs> And you don't get radio up in North Alberta because uh, it's, you know, it's a dead zone up there. So I had a lot of time just by myself, not listening to anything. Mm. Making and, it work. Isn't that Doug and the Slugs? Uh, yes, but not that <laughs> album, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't mind that at all. Like, I, I think I could go yeah. a few days without talking to someone and not mind. It's just my life isn't structured that way. Mm -hmm. Just same. Yeah. A couple yeah. days, maybe. Um, longer if you don't count, think, you know, quick exchanges, you know, somebody asking how you are and saying good. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I could, I could probably go, you yeah. know, a week without yeah. needing to, to chat. Well, it's um, interesting because I probably consider myself more of an introvert than an extrovert. 
But if I went more than a day without actually talking to somebody, I think it would not feel great. Like, mm -hmm. I think I can understand now why uh, solitary confinement is such a punishing yeah. um, discipline or um, pun punishment. <laughs> punishing, punishment. Punishing, punishment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, and the, just the idea that, you know, we, I think we are social creatures and we long for connection, even when we think we would rather not. I don't yeah. know. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know. I, it's an yeah. experiment that I haven't undertaken. Yeah. yeah. I feel like it's a continuum. Like, like I'm pretty introverted. And for me, like I used to, when I was single, accept like one or two social invitations a year just to kind of remember what it's like to go to someone's place and, and attend a party or something like that. But for me, like if I was feeling lonely, I would take a bus downtown and walk around a bit where other people were walking around and maybe go to a mall or, you know, a bookstore and kind of hang around a bit mm -hmm. and then come home, not actually having interacted with anyone, but mm -hmm. been near them and hearing them. Mm -hmm. And that was enough social interaction for me. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I did like that little touch of interaction. So uh, not completely isolated. I, I wouldn't want to be in the woods alone for 27 years at all. But I yeah. do like the you idea know, of crazy. having just small contacts with people. Yeah. Yeah, because mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, as I was reading it too, I was thinking, oh, like, I wonder how that would be. And then around the same time, I did two trips up to Riding Mountain and did some tenting. I mean, with my son, but... At this last trip, I was thinking, like, I think I need to come up here by myself and mm -hmm. and tent and just start the fire on my own and, you know, and be by myself and look at the stars and, um, yeah. You know, come to think of it, too, like, because he was within earshot of people and could hear people, it's kind of the same yeah. way that I would have yeah. those tertiary right. like, mm -hmm. or slight contacts with people. Or even, like, being in their houses. Right. <laughs> yeah. And but, oh, he obviously found comfort in books, too. Right. So yeah, which brings up another point. Like, he wasn't actually outside human communication completely. He, mm -hmm. Just his communication came in the form of books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's someone talking to you from a far away time and place, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that came up in the book was that I felt that Notes from the Underground by uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky uh, was speaking directly to him. Have you had books that feel like they're speaking to you or like were written for you or just made a lot of sense to you? Christina underscore N underscore Melody on Instagram said The Little Prince, mm. which mm. Casanova's Journals and the Introduction to Don Quixote. Hmm. <laughs> Which makes me curious. I might. Don Quixote was a fun book. I read yeah. it many years ago and it was yeah. not what I expected, but huh. it yeah. was quite interesting. When I uh, thought about this question, I was thinking of like, maybe I was thinking more literally, but books that spoke to me, I was thinking of books that were written in the first person. Mm. Uh, and so one that came to mind that one that we are all familiar with was uh, Middlesex by Jeffrey Eugenides, how yeah. it's written and how we were all taken with the almost like the grandiose, uh, you know, almost like a ringleader of a three ring circus kind of approach that he was telling his or her their story. That was a complicated one. Yeah. Um, but I remember that one, there was a, an immediacy to it. And another one that I thought of, which uses a combination of uh, first person, third person, and even the second person is Timothy Findlay's The Wars, mm. uh, which I had read. And, and it just, it's almost like a collage of different points of view telling one soldier's story through World War I. So I um, just wanted to read this one tiny little section of it where it starts and it says, it grabs you because it says, you begin at the archives with photographs, Robert and Rowena, rabbits in wheelchairs, children, dogs and horses, Barbara Dorsey, the SS Masanabi, Madeline Wood, boxes and boxes of snapshots and portraits, maps and letters, cablegrams and clippings from the papers, all you have to do is sign them out and carry them across the room. Spread over tabletops. A whole age lies in fragments underneath the lamps. The war to end all wars. All you can hear is the wristwatch on your arm. Outside, it snows. The dark comes early. The archivist is gazing from her desk. She coughs. The boxes smell of yellow dust. You hold your breath. As the past moves under your fingertips, part of it crumbles. Other parts you know you'll never find. This is what you have. 
Hmm. I could see yeah. why. Yeah, you, you're probably like, I want to be there. Yeah, I want to yeah. be there right now I at can just, that table. I can just imagine yeah. like everything laid out, and then the story grows from that. And mm-hmm. it's yeah. So I mean, mm-hmm. uh, those are a couple of options. And throw think. wristwatch in there. Yeah, and you, got, right. yeah you got yeah, Trevor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he was quite, uh, quite one of my faves. Yeah, I was I was thinking about this question too, um, and I was remembering I it was like. 91 or something. And I was traveling with my ex in Australia and New Zealand. And I had taken some books with me. And there was one book, The Golden Notebook by Doris Lessing. It's like written in 1962. I think my mom probably gave it to me. And I loved it so much. And there was a point on our travels where we just couldn't carry the books anymore. So and if we had read them, so we had to, you know, leave them at a youth hostel or at the campground. And I remember actually crying because <laughs> it was a book that I wanted to, to, to keep. And it was really sort of explored uh, like mental and societal breakdown. Um, it was uh, set up in um, four notebooks about this writer, Anna, four notebooks. And then she wants to bring them all together into one golden notebook. And each of the notebooks represented a different part of her life, like colonialism and growing up in Africa. She was a white writer, communism, um, feminism, and uh, and then her own sort of personal. And I don't know, it just really spoke to me at that time being, you know, a 22 year old traveling the world and exploring um, um, different cultures and ideas and also to the war was happening right then too and it was also anti-war anyway it was this like really kind of profound book but uh yeah and i cried when i had to give it away but uh, yeah what about you the two books that i thought of right away and i was just going trying to jog my memory of any other ones but the one that i thought of right away is my favorite book of all time which we read which was long way to a small angry planet mm-hmm. um because uh, when you when you when you're talking about Trevor uh, starting the book and then he starts talking about wristwatches and it's like yes like uh, uh, it's Doctor Chef whenever when she first introduces Doctor Chef for me I'm like yep this is speaking directly to me I don't know why but this is my book and these are my people mm-hmm. um, and then the other one came to mind because I just read the follow up to it which was the um, All Systems Read by Martha Wells the first in the Murderbot series because I just read the standalone novel that came out so because something about Murderbot I just understood. Understand. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so yeah, those are the two, and I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure there's so yeah. m- so many more. And sometimes it's just it's also just speaks to where you are in your life and in, exactly. in your brain. But then there are some that you can go back to and reread periodically throughout your life. Yeah, that time of life thing. Like the book that I thought of was uh, the Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan which I read at a point in my life where I was really questioning my worldview. And I had Mm. ideas that were kind of swirling in my head. And Carl Sagan summed them all up in a clear way. Like, Mm -hmm. it's like he had sat down to say, listen, Dennis, I understand you're trying to think of some things right (laughs) now. And uh, the world is a little confusing. And here... It's an impassioned championing of the scientific method and kind of explaining how it works and how it relates to life and why we think of things the way we do. And it just connected at the right point. He had the right tone. He had, you know, he he was a very good writer. And that point in my life, it was the perfect time for me to read it. And I've recommended it to some other people who seem to be at a similar point in their life since then. Yeah, if you're, you know, one of those people who knocks on doors to uh, share your beliefs with people, I will talk to you. And Mm. eventually this book will come up. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) nice. Yeah, this was an interesting question. Like, uh, you know, to sort of think back to books and and go quite far back. Uh, Like, I'm totally going to read The Golden Notebook again, and I hope I'm not disappointed. (laughs) Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. Which actually brings up another question that we asked. At one point in the book, Night... When he's communicating with Finkel, he asks him to send him a video of his bookshelf so he could see what he read, which was an interesting conversational gambit. (laughs) Yeah, it's all it's the only thing that he wanted, you know, for his story was, you know, that he had a video. Yeah, let me know what you've read. Let me know what's on your shelf. (laughs) And you know what? On uh, Finkel's um, web page or like his website, there's a picture of him arm leaning against his bookshelf. <laughs> that, that, that reminds me of that, that old joke about the guy who uh, puts an ad in for a, a mail order bride and a tractor and it says, send picture of tractor. <laughs> <laughs> like a far- <laughs> so if, uh, if you had to send a video of your bookshelf, what would it show? Mine would not be a good representation of what I read. 
at all because I don't buy books. Mm. I work at a library. <laughs> so the books that I own are either ones that I was given um, and probably have not read because I tend to read the library books first because I need to get them back. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or, I mean, there's probably a couple shelves that are the books that I really wanted to own and so asked for or bought for myself. But otherwise, it doesn't really represent what I read because I read them and then I bring them back to the library. <laughs> yeah, so. that's a good point, actually, because uh, I think my bookshop would um, show books of a certain time of my life because I didn't always work for a public library. Well, exactly, yeah. And so when I started working for a public library, I stopped buying as many books because I was in a book club. So I bought lots of books before, but now I don't <laughs> do mm-hmm. that. But also what I was thinking was I thought it would reveal sort of what a bad librarian I am. Like it is so unorganized. Oh, Nothing is alphabetical. <laughs> nothing's like in any yeah. sort of, like I never know where anything is. No. It's not by genre. It's not by subject, like nothing. So, yeah. um, cause I'm always, yeah. Cause that's what we do at work. I, Why I would we so do that like at home? <laughs> it's like working at McDonald's then just going home and cooking a bunch of hamburgers. Like you're not going to do that. You're not going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, on, on Facebook, Christy weighed in and she said that she, what it would reveal about her was that she used to work at Value Village and she amassed a whole lot of books that you will likely never get to. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. I guess, you know, we think it's a bookshelf that you have in your home, it's like a, a display. Like, yeah. is it aspirational? Like, I'm going to get to these books at one day. Like, I have, a, <laughs> I have a collection on mine that I think it's Ever Gibbons, The History of the Roman Empire. And it's like a four or five volume set. It looks beautiful. <laughs> I have not ever opened it, I don't think. Yeah. But I one mean, of these days, I'm like, you know what? I'm, you know, there might be a pandemic or something where I just. <laughs> I was going to say, if you didn't do it during quarantine, <laughs> yeah. when are you going to do it? I know. If I haven't read from in March, I should probably just get rid of it. Because that was the real test. Yeah. But yeah, book, books and bookshelves are often like, yeah, decor, right? Mm-hmm. You know, a wall of books. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, you know, it's interesting. Even though I've worked in libraries since I was 17, I have always also bought books. Mm-hmm. So it, it's stuff that just caught my interest when I was in a bookstore. So if you look at my bookshelf, it's like stuff from over 30 years of uh, just different stages of reading. Like, you may be surprised to know, I have a book by Rush Limbaugh on my shelf and Donald Trump's Art of the Deal, which I bought back then. Interesting. Oh. Not that I agree with those ideas now, but at the time, I was kind of interested in that So, like, do you ever call your collection? Do you ever sort of go through and go, "Mm, no, 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 no. No, not really. Yeah. Because it, it's part of my reading past, right? I, right. Uh, I have dictionaries. I have science books, philosophy. I've got a lot of cartoon collections like mm-hmm. Dilbert and Foxtrot and Bloom County, lots of Nero Wolf mysteries, Kurt Vonnegut novels. Um, and I've, like at least 20% of my shelves are stuff that I have not read because mm-hmm. I bought them because they look cool. Yeah. And I wanted to read them and I really should at some point. But uh, yeah, it's so it's all over the place, really. Yeah. I, I don't know what impression people would get of me if they actually looked at the shelf and assumed. <laughs> well, that's what you yeah, read. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Because it, it's, I wouldn't buy the same books now, but I did at some point. Yeah. 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 Yeah, sometimes too, I, I love pulling a book off a shelf and then opening it because my mom always would write in it. Mm. And so, and I have kept those, even though some of the books, you know, I don't really... Yeah. It, it was a fine book, but because it was inscribed, yeah. you know, Kirsten Deer. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Just thought you'd like this lovely story about sisters. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an interesting thing, too, about like Knight's experience out in the woods is he didn't have a lot of choice about what books he read. Yeah. You know, if they only have James Patterson, then he reads James Patterson. Mm-hmm. If they have, you know, uh, Kierkegaard, then he reads Kierkegaard. Uh, it's... And a very eclectic way of going about your reading, I guess. He is like an organic uh, grab bag. You just got to, whatever mm-hmm. you get, you're into. Well, and then maybe starting to think too, like, oh, yeah, there's another James Patterson. I'll take that because I'll read it quickly and then it'll become my mattress or my my <laughs> <Right>. my, yeah, <laughs> my floor or whatever, or whatever it is. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and also the way people offered to leave books for him, like when he yeah. was breaking in and they're like, okay, well, he's stealing books. What if we offer to give him stuff yeah. instead mm-hmm. and he wouldn't take it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, or By, they would leave. bypass the gift and break into the yeah. cabin yeah. anyway. Or when people were starting to put things like, give us a list of what you need. Yeah. And he was afraid that it would be poisoned and he yeah. wouldn't take it. So he wouldn't, 
Yeah, because people are trying to, I guess, get into his mind and understand, like, if, well, if I was in his shoes, you know, I would want to look this person, but yeah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't conform to what the people that are around him wanted him to be, which made well, him he kind had of... no trust. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a big thing there, because uh, it's like the people who were responding to that, some of them were trying to be compassionate and caring. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, this person's out in the woods and they're breaking in, obviously, for survival stuff, because he's not stealing TVs or anything. So they're like trying to see how can I be helpful? The response to the cabin owners in the area was quite varied, Mm -hmm. you know, between those, the one guy who go hid there with a gun waiting to shoot him for like two weeks to other people trying to give him groceries and books and other things that he would need. Mm -hmm. It was kind of all over the map. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I would respond if someone was breaking into my home or my second home. Not that I have a second home, but you know, it's, it's interesting. Like that's a... I don't even know how to think about that. It hadn't occurred to me before, but it's a prism to look through and see kind of the spread of humanity's response to something like this. Yeah. Well, I I mean, I would, I very easily don't feel safe. So if I had a place and somebody was coming and going from it when I wasn't there, I would, it would really shake me. But mm-hmm. not everybody's like that. The most amazing example was um, somebody who used to work here with that when it was Centennial and, um, I don't know where he is now, but he had traveled all kinds of places. And he told this story of he went back to his apartment one day and the door was open and there was somebody inside. And he didn't he didn't really care because he doesn't have a lot of stuff. He traveled. He moved Mm -hmm. around a lot. All his important stuff was in a safe deposit box, like his passport and all that stuff. So he just went back outside and waited for them to leave and then (laughs) kind of walked along behind them and then called from wherever they stopped next, called on a payphone for the cops to come and get them. Hmm. And it's like some people, you know, their stuff, like stuff doesn't really matter so much to them. Yeah. Yeah. And his own feeling of security wasn't threatened yeah. in a, in the way that my feeling of security yeah. would be because. Oh, well, and also like, you know, when to say the break in is almost a misnomer because he was so meticulous with his removing the hinges <laughs> from the door and replacing <laughs> yeah. the door uh, so that it would just be that very eerie feeling of coming up to your cottage and not knowing right away, like the, your cottage does not look like it's been, camp. you go in, you may not even notice right away, but they're like, oh, wait, wait, do we have those cans of soup or, yeah. you know, you know, and yeah. then, you know, it's happened again and again. And, you, and like the psychological damage, I could, I could totally relate to that as being, I mean, we go and say, well, you know, privilege and stuff, but it, it, it could definitely, I, I could relate to the people that were saying that this is a terrible thing and it has to stop. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, and some, and for and some me, of them were describing like too, like they thought a family member was taking stuff, you know, and uh, like I, I know a person who had family member uh, who could conceivably like break into their house and take stuff that stress in a relationship. Yeah. When you think my kid came in here and took the stuff mm-hmm. that we had put away, yeah. that can be very damaging in yeah. a family dynamic. What this book, what that did for me though, is make me like examine like why would, why does that bother me so much? The idea of somebody in my space, especially if it's like a recreational space that I only go to sometimes. Like, why couldn't, why is, why, why is it such a social transgression for somebody to go in to my place when I'm not there and take something that they need or want? You know, like the books that I put there that I don't want in my house, right? Because people's cottages collection of books is usually different than their regular collection <laughs> of books. You know, like, but, but for me, it does, it would feel like a, like a violation. But why do we have this, like, such attachment to private property and private stuff that we would, you know, instead of just saying, he's clearly just coming and taking what he needs, so I'm going to be okay with it, Right. Like it's, it's interesting because I, I, I do feel like I would personally react very, very emotionally and whatever. And I, and I'm not quite sure why if that think, makes sense. I feel like that's a survival mechanism that's wired into us, right? Like it could if, be. if we evolved in a time of resource scarcity, but it could also you, be cultural. Yeah, it could be. Like too. if you, if you live someplace where, you know, you know, childcare is more communal and you can just, your kid can just go out and play. You know, and everybody yeah. sort of watches each other and they're, you, and you don't have these like this, this is my property kind of idea. Then maybe you wouldn't feel violated if somebody just, you know, help themselves or like log cabins, right? I and anybody actually, can just come in and warm up. Like, I, have, I have actually heard of that in some places where uh, I, this was many years ago, so I don't have a specific, but 
where they said they were, they came across a cabin and uh, it was open. It was unlocked yeah. and it had a note on it saying, stay if you need to, uh, please don't make a mess. And uh, I guess, you know, they may have been in a situation where people were doing that anyway. So they just left a note and yeah. asked people and to be people nice. People don't have to break in that. Yeah. They just go in. But see, if Save somebody had done that, Christopher Knight would have avoided it. Avoided yeah, he would it have then. bypassed that. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking yeah. it was a trap. Or yeah. A trick. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's the hardest thing to imagine out of his lifestyle, too, is not just that he was isolating from other people, but that he couldn't trust anyone in the slightest. Mm -hmm. I mean, when he described that point where he saw those people when he was out walking and he just kind of waved to show his hand like they had showed their hands, you know, and uh, I think they shouted something like, we won't tell anyone because mm -hmm. the grandfather like said, no, no, we, oh, yeah. we need to leave this guy alone. We don't, we need to make sure we don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. And, and so they made that promise. And, uh, and then he also, uh, <laughs> it was interesting too, how uh, Knight felt a little, that promise was still in effect and he was surprised to learn that they had talked about it afterwards because they figured, well, he's been found. Mm -hmm. I guess we can tell our story now. Mm -hmm. and, and in his mind, no, mm -hmm. no one said that we broke the promise. The promise is still there. He was like, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. his, uh, his dedication to honesty. He's an idealist. Yeah, yeah. It was very interesting. So one of the other things that uh, he did a lot of was nothing mm -hmm. because you know, especially for five months of the year in the winter, he didn't leave his campsite. Uh, so the concept of non-doing, intentional non-doing is something that comes up in the book. Uh, is that something that appeals to you? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think theoretically, for a short period of time. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, some of the the work that I've been doing the, over the last year just for myself and with meditation and non-doing is like a big part of that. And it doesn't mean that you're actually not doing anything, you know, cause you're focusing on your breath. You're, you know, you're actually, you're, you're meditating, you're actually doing something and something very important for yourself. But I think in this society of doers, you know, and we're not allowed to just be sitting and staring off into space. <laughs> yeah. Um, Otherwise known as thinking. Right. I, always, yeah. I, I had somebody complain once that, that one of my, one of the people that work at Fort Gary Library was staring off into space. Mm -hmm. And I, and I want to say like, are you sure that they weren't just thinking? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because some, you know, they might've been thinking about something. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't bust them or anything because come on. There's I mean, always a lot going on. And par and part of non doing too is just also just letting things be. Yeah. And sort of allowing things to sort of unfold as they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. I'm still really working hard on that. <laughs> Cause that's tough. It I is think tough. that's tough. The non doing the, the sitting there and you know and doing the meditation, I'm I try to do daily now, but just letting things just go, like, and just trusting yeah. that it, mm -hmm. it's just going to unfold as it should. That's harder. When, when I when I start thinking about the whole non-doing and what it means, it made me think of, uh, you know, Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield, who he was up on the ISS for all that time. And he had written a book a couple of years ago about his experiences. And he talked about his philosophy of being a zero and how mm -hmm. he is always trying to be a zero. And he was describing it as saying that there are, three ways you can be. You can be a minus one, a zero, or a plus one. And um, a, you don't ever want to be a minus one because a minus one is you are a, a negative influence on something. Mm, right. And a plus one is a positive influence. But he, what, like uh, any new situation, he uh, strives to be a zero, which is just a fit in, see how something's working and spend all this time seeing where he can contribute without being a detriment, but not coming up with all kinds of new great ideas. And he said that it's hard for astronauts because they're all plus ones. Yeah. But when you're living on the ISS, you all have to work together. And so I thought that was an interesting idea. The, the whole, it's, so it's not that he's not doing anything, but the idea of sort of like reading the room or, or taking an overview and just seeing where do I fit in. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I was thinking about. I'm probably totally butchering his theory, but I, that's what came to me uh, when I thought of this. Yeah. Yeah, it's I think that's a great idea because I think there's a lot to be said for letting things proceed naturally and not trying to direct things too much. Because as soon as you start trying to dictate or direct the, the way things going, you're saying that you know 
how they should be Mm -hmm. or, you know, especially something like dealing with other people or, you know, I'm thinking about parenting and stuff like that. Like sometimes the more you're doing and the more you're trying to force, the less likely it is that that's what should be happening. So it's really, yeah, I'm the minus one, zero plus one thing. That's very interesting because sometimes, and you teach you that in yoga too, right? Like sometimes you just try to do the the minimum you need, use the use only the muscle that you actually need to use and relax everything else because otherwise you're working too hard, hmm. harder than you need to be. We had one other question for social media. And frankly, I didn't know what to make of it. Because <laughs> <laughs> some philosophers believe that loneliness mm. is the only true feeling there is. Do you agree? And I have to say up front, I can't even conceive of how, <laughs> of how this works because uh, I, I can't conceive of any definition of emotions that leaves out things like fear and happiness or tries to define them as being solely part of another emotion. So I, where does the question come from exactly? It is from the book, like sort of right at the end of the book, he talks about loneliness and being alone and yeah, some philosophers believe that loneliness is the only true feeling there is. It's like a quote from mm. the actual book. We live orphaned on a tiny rock in the immense, immense vastness of space with no hint of even the simplest form of life anywhere around us for billions upon billions of miles alone beyond all imagining. We live locked in our own heads and can never entirely know the experience of another person. Even if we're surrounded by family and friends, we journey into death completely alone. Hmm. I still agree, disagree with the idea that it's the only emotion. <laughs> yeah, philosophers don't always have it right. Oh, you yeah. yeah. And, and, and some philosophers say otherwise, too. Yeah. Bright Libby on uh, Instagram said, sorting and coming to terms with those concepts is definitely one of life's most challenging aspects. This book is a fantastic read. 10 out of 10 would recommend. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking too, I was struggling with this question and uh, the idea that, well, maybe is loneliness like a like a default sort of position that like you are, you are born alone, we die alone, we, we, we journey through life with different people, but ultimately it's our journey. And, uh, but then like that's always in conflict with the whole creating community, which I mentioned before and, and trying to find connect, you're striving for connections in an otherwise like empty, uh, world. Uh, so I don't, I don't Well, and know. I wonder about the word loneliness, like, sure, we come into this world alone and we leave it alone. Except we don't al- really. But, but alone doesn't mean lonely. Yeah, it's very right. like it, I, I, I love being alone and I never feel lonely. Yeah. So I feel like that's it's conflating maybe the two a, a misreading of that Michael Finkel has <laughs> Yeah, I'd made, be interested mm-hmm. to know, you know which philosopher is, because it feels very Western. It feels very like Greek-Roman duality yeah, thing. Like if you get into Nietzsche Eastern or... philosophies, if you get into Buddhism, everything's yeah. connected. You are not alone because right. you are not your ego. You are not a standalone unique being you are intimately connected with every other thing ever i guess you guys didn't so, read the like the last page of the book <laughs> where it talks about the philosophers and uh, loneliness um, yeah, solitude is the profoundest fact of the human condition wrote the mexican poet and nobel laureate octavia paz ultimately and precisely in the deepest and most important matters we are an unspeakably alone wrote Kind of Maria Rilke, but see again, it's like solitude and alone. It doesn't mean lonely. Yeah, and like, I would and I would argue mm-hmm. with the premise that we are solitude that we mm-hmm. are whatever. Although it yeah. does. It just occurred to me as you're reading that out that I was talking a bit about how his dedication to honesty, like telling the truth as he understood it, and one of the things I've thought in the past is like we don't know what's in other people's heads. The only indications we get of what's on other people's heads is their actions and their words. And when we lie to each other, we upset the the barest connection that we have with each other. The only way I can trust you is if I can trust the words you're telling me are accurate. And once they fail to be accurate, then I can't trust you anymore. And that connection, as tenuous as it was, was severed. So he seemed to have a very strong, I don't know if that was his reasoning for it, but, uh, you know, 
the dedication is trying to be as honest as possible is maybe part of that idea that in order to connect to other people, that's all we have right. to rely on. Yeah. yeah, I'd argue with that too. Yeah. I think that there's lots of ways other than somebody's words to hear what they're saying. And somebody well, could tell you. Words and actions. Words but. and actions, body language, pheromones. You know, like there's lots of ways of, of detecting messages. And somebody could be telling you one thing and you could know they're lying. But that doesn't necessarily have to, you know, s- sever some sort of, you know, social trust. Well, I don't know. If you lie, for, if you lie to think, me often enough, I then that I don't that trust we you. <laughs> overemphasize the importance of vocalizations of words, even though words are extremely important. We forget that there's lots of other ways of communicating and that you should be paying attention to those too. I think what I was saying that was less about words and more about the uh, honest communication, however that is done. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's hard to Knight deceive. wasn't communicating in any way, really. No, yeah. and that's the Aside other thing too, from, when he was isolated. He, he was. <laughs> no, I, think, yeah. I mean, he, I think he was. He was interacting with people. He was interacting with the world around him. Uh, just not with words. Well, but he tried to hide all of his interactions, every single one of them. The reason he was careful breaking and yet, into people's if he, places if he was, really wanted to hide and avoid communication, he would not have hidden where he was. He would have gone far away like other explorers have. have. Yeah, but in the United States, where could he have gone? <laughs> North Alaska. <Dakota. laughs> but he would have but had to cross borders. You know, he would yeah. have... It people d- well, he needed people around because he needed the stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, it's how he chose to live yeah. his life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But he, like, it was, yeah, like he didn't keep a journal. I mean, I quite liked that because it was like, I'm doing, this is for me. You know, this isn't for writing Journals? a book. This isn't for... It, like, Keeping a journal? Yeah, like yeah. he didn't keep a journal. He did, wasn't going to come up with sort of some huge, you know, sort of outlook on, on life that he had discovered after these 27 years. He wasn't going to come out of the forest and say, I have discovered the meaning of life. This was really just for him. Mm-hmm. And I quite liked that in this society where we're always doing something. And, and Michael Finkel is an example of that you know, to get something for himself. Like, you know, the, 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 with the Christian Longo, like he needed to get his reputation back. And so he connected with yeah. this guy right at the right time to then create this, this memoir. And, you know, this, the same with reaching out to, uh, to this, this Christian knight who didn't want to be reached out to really well that was um, the other major criticism of the book is mm-hmm. how pers- pers- persevering perseverant pers- yeah whatever it is <laughs> how he persevered how he much he pursued <laughs> yeah. um christopher knight yeah. in wanting to get answers from him and whether that was mm-hmm. ethical even mm-hmm. For, you know, somebody who put up a lot of, of signals saying that he didn't want to participate in this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And people are back and forth on that. Yeah. Well, we could go on quite a bit I more. Know. I know. Because this was a fascinating yeah. book. Yeah. <gasps> but we should probably move on to mm-hmm. our next segment, which is called, Can You Tell Me a Book I Would Also Like? Can I go first? Yes. <laughs> Just because we are talking about going farther and I mentioned going to Alaska because I wanted to recommend Into the Wild by John Krakauer, because it's also about a guy named Chris. Uh, his name is Chris <laughs> McCandless. And he, uh, at a young age, decided to that he needed to ditch civilization and try to find someplace that was actually wild and where there wasn't, you couldn't see the touch of civilization anywhere. So he traveled all over the place. So it's also a thought-provoking story about survival, but more about um, why this Chris left the world and how he tried to survive. Um, spoiler alert, he does not do as well as Christopher Knight. Uh, and this was also made into a movie, um, mm-hmm. which was quite good. So that's Into the Wild by John Krakauer. Very highly recommended. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, for me, one of the maybe the shortcomings of Stranger in the Woods was that at the end of it, we I felt we still didn't really know much about Christopher Knight, like his motivations. And he would only show us what he was willing to show to Michael Finkel. And so I started thinking a little bit more about some of the other sort of hermits that may have come up in the books. And so uh, one of them was uh, Thomas Merton, who was uh, a hermit. (laughs) Uh, He was also a uh, monk 
in the second half of the 20th century. And uh, I like this story about him, how he decided on when he was trying to decide what kind of a monk he should be. Uh, he did this thing where he just opened the Bible at random and pointed to a, a Bible verse, which apparently is a real thing. It's called Sorte's Sanctorum. And so he absolutely, he just turned to um, Luke chapter one, uh, verse uh, 20, which was, behold, you shall be silent. And he, and he just decided, you know what? I'm going to be a Trappist monk. And uh, which he did. So he lived in the Abbey of uh, Gethsemane in Kentucky. So it was, Gethsemane was named as well as like the garden in, in the Easter story, but spelled differently. So I don't know if it was like they were worried about a lawsuit or something, but, uh, but he, so he, he was originally part of the Abbey's daily activities, but then he eventually asked if could he live on a portion of the property just by himself. And they granted that wish. Um, but the interesting thing about Thomas Merton is that although he lived as a hermit, he did an uh, like incredible amount of writing and reflections on spirituality, social justice. And even though he was removed from the world, he was intimately involved in it. And it was a time like he became a priest right like a day or two after Pearl Harbor. And he died uh, when uh, Nixon was president. So we think about all the social upheaval in the United States during that part of the 20th century. And uh, it's very interesting. And like what you were saying, Erica, about how, you know, the Eastern philosophy, everything is connected. One of the things that he focused on towards the end of his life was trying to find common ground between the, uh, sort of the Western thought and, and Eastern mysticism and, mm -hmm. and and trying to see that there are commonalities there and, and trying to sort of find a unification of it. So having said all that, the book that I recommend is called When the Trees Say Nothing, Writings on Nature by Thomas Merton. Mm. Uh, and it's just an interesting book of just verses of taken from his journals and diaries of his thoughts of living in the woods. I like well, it. I guess I should point out also, like we're talking about Eastern and Western, but you know, a lot of indigenous worldviews from around the world are based on the idea of connectivity between each other, between and ancestors and the natural world. So it isn't even just Western, Eastern. And there's mm. plenty of examples of ways of thinking that are not based around humans being alone <laughs> and lonely. <laughs> <laughs> I liked in the book, too, that he talked about a number of different hermits, you know, from the 12th century to 1990, the woman, well, he called her a hermit, but like who voluntarily went and lived in that cave for 111 days. And I thought, found all of that very, very interesting, too. So... And this whole and has it? Did anyone look up the um the website the, her the hermitarian? Yeah, I looked at it. Yeah, <laughs> it it's, doesn't have a forum anymore. Oh um, yeah, I was trying to find. So that. there were some resources linked there, but uh, yeah. and they do have their review of uh, Stranger in the Woods there. Yes, yes. Anyway, so that was kind of interesting too. All that. I, I feel like he was like trying to flush the book out a little bit by adding some of that information, but I found it very very interesting. So hmm. my book that I have read um, and that you might like to read because of The Stranger in the Woods or not, um, is in <laughs> Intimations, Six Essays by Sadie Smith. This is Zadie Smith, sorry. This is super, super new. Like hmm. it was written during the early months of lockdown. It explores ideas, feelings, and questions prompted by an unprecedented situation. What does it mean to submit to a new reality or to resist it? How do we compare relative sufferings? What is the relationship between time and work? In our isolation, what do other people mean to us? How do we think about them? What is the ratio of contempt to ca compassion in a crisis? When an unfamiliar world arrives, what does it reveal about the world that came before it? It is this very sort of intimate book. It's really nice and small, fl very slim volume. There's six essays in it, and they're, each of them are quite short, about 10 pages. Um, I heard about this book on the Adam Buxton podcast. He did an interview with Zadie Smith, and um, she just seemed like such a wonderful person and really humble and really smart and so funny. And she said at the beginning of the pandemic, she was just full of self-pity. And she just was like, just terrified about everything. And she just couldn't figure out what to do with herself. And so for her, writing was almost like sort of the, the banana breads of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the <laughs> of <sourdough>. other people, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, something to do. But she never meant to like sell this and publish this. She was just writing because this is what she also just needed to sort of pull herself together, I guess, and work through some of that mental instability she, she was experiencing. So it's, 
it's a really interesting book. It's, it speaks obviously very much of this time, uh, the pandemic and uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. But she said she just wrote the book also as it, be, as it became a book, more as something to maybe keep people company during this time, which I thought was really Aww. lovely. And it's lovely. I just, I love her writing anyway. Um, and all of the royalties go uh, to charity. So mm. for that book. It so. sounds like she didn't want us to feel alone. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 That's right. Books will help with that. That's entirely true. (laughs) So for my book, I figured if you like true stories of individuals heading off into the wilds on their own, you might enjoy Paddle to the Arctic by Don Sterkel. Don Sterkel is a Winnipeg legend and is probably most famous for traveling nearly 20,000 kilometers from Winnipeg to Brazil by canoe Mm -hmm. with his sons Dana and Jeff in the early 80s, a trip that he wrote about in his book Paddle to the Amazon. I live a short walk from the park where they drop their canoe into the Red River. Paddle to the Arctic is an account of his attempt to kayak through the Northwest Passage in the early 1990s, most of which he did solo. Starkel is an adventurer, so it's no surprise that you can read a fair bit of ego in his writing. (laughs) But he was also an honest writer, giving you insights into his personality that I found fascinating. The trip itself was intense and difficult. I don't want to spoil too much, but Starkel did not come out of this journey unscathed. After reading Paddle to the Arctic, I'd also recommend reading Kabluna in the Yellow Kayak by Victoria Jason. I mentioned that Strakel's trip was mostly solo, but the part that wasn't solo was when he traveled with Victoria Jason on the initial leg of the trip. One of the senses you get from reading Strakel's books is that he was difficult to get along with. (laughs) And this is confirmed in Jason's book. Uh, The two of them had very different approaches to their journey, and they butted heads a lot. After their initial journey together fell apart, they both continued their journey separately, and I found it fascinating to read their different views of what was, on at least one level, the same trip. Mm -hmm. So, Paddle to the Arctic by Don Sterkel. Interesting. I just heard on the Doc Project, they had a two-part series about their the paddle to um, the to the Amazon. Yeah, it was very interesting. After that happened, like his son Dana, who had stuck with him for the whole trip, his other son left because yeah. he couldn't deal with his dad anymore. Um, <laughs> but uh, he was learning to play guitar on the yeah. way. And uh, around sometime in the 80s, uh, Dana Starkel actually showed up at my parents' house because he was going door to door selling his CDs of himself playing <laughs> oh. classical guitar. Oh, that's So I awesome. just feel like really connected. Like was that after the This <laughs> was after. Oh, yeah. yeah. But mm-hmm. a, fa- a fascinating it was a person. very, very interesting story. Yeah. 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 Completely. Uh, he almost like, he, I think he did hit his dad over the head with a paddle a few <laughs> Probably. times. Probably. <laughs> a few times. <laughs> now it is time for everyone's favorite segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds, the part of our show where our hosts ramble on about a word we've got stuck in our brains. <laughs> Who would like to like go that first? Intro. That's good. <laughs> I mean, I will. Um, also, because my, my word kind of fits, fits with that. I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and it's the concept of being proactive, which is, uh, in case you aren't sure, being proactive <laughs> is taking action by causing change uh, and not only responding to change when it happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't actually like this word, but I like this word. It's very complicated. So when uh, proactive first became a buzzword several years ago, I absolutely hated it. It seemed to me just like a fancy way of saying action and taking action. It's like, you're just being active. Like, you're, why do you have to say proactive? But in some situations and more and more, I, I haven't been able to find a better one for what I'm seeing uh, for when you decide to take action in an anticipatory way for something that, you know, hasn't happened yet, but you're, you're figuring out how to act on it. These days, there seems to be a greater and greater need for this, which, which is to say we're seeing more clearly the lack of being proactive and the damage that lack can cause. Sometimes it's very harmful to wait until there is a problem or wait until action is forced. It costs stress, time, lives, and often much more money. But we're also seeing how reluctant large organizations are to being proactive. After all, they aren't sure always in what direction to go. And it takes a massive amount of effort to change direction uh, when you're a large organization, like navigating a large ship. It seems to me, though, that now that individual people are expected to often be proactive, to change and adapt quickly, we are, we are no longer willing to wait for those organizations that still prefer to react. We are no longer willing to do more ourselves than those organizations, companies, or governments are willing to do as well. I still 
don't really like the word proactive. It's like pre-registration. It feels redundant. <laughs> but I feel like the concept is crucial right now, and that we all better get on board. That's my little mini rant about proactive. <laughs> that's, that's good. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> I'm pro. You're proactive. <laughs> I still stance. don't like the word, but there's yeah. a better word. <laughs> well, after after Erica's very thoughtful word, mine is kind of self-serving. Mm. It's okay. Uh, Remember last month's white mine was but. Oh, right. So that's true. My self-serving. And also mine may not even be a word. Oh. But, uh, <laughs> my word is nonology. And we've all heard of a trilogy. But nonology oh. is a collection of nine books because I'm happy to report I finished Tales of the City. <laughs> hey. and, hey. and I did it. Before September 22nd. So my promise to do it before the summer was over <laughs> uh, holds true. Oh, good. Wow. Um, wow. Holding yeah, you it, to it. I, it. It happened. And I, I'm glad I don't have to do anything because I didn't do it. Congratulations. Because, <laughs> and uh, yes, I enjoyed it. I, 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 you know, this, it, yeah, there were there stronger entries less, but it, uh, it, I enjoyed it right to the end. Uh, my favorite one out of all, I think, was one in, in the middle called Significant Others. Uh, which was about um, and uh, no spoilers. Okay, no, I'm just gonna say it's, it was about sort of like a, a Lilith Fair type huh. all women's festival oh. that's happening down the river from this uh, white male conservative <laughs> camp. Oh no! Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's just like high comedy. It's it's excellent. <laughs> it's like the very best uh, that you could. Yeah. So anyway, I think that's in the Netflix. Oh, is it? Okay, yeah, I'm okay. I'm pretty yeah. sure. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, yeah, Tales of the City finished. You won't hear me mention it again. Uh, <laughs> but I, I feel like a sense of accomplishment of reading the whole series. I enjoyed it. And that's all I got. Nonology. So, so next that fancy volume, multiple volume, whatever on your bookshelf, right? Yeah. Now that you've conquered Tales. Exactly. Next now, now, <laughs> now it's Edward Gibbons, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, history of the Roman Empire. You only have... <laughs> You only have until the solstice. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> you have one season. Ready, go. <laughs> one. <laughs> I thought you were going to say my favorite book, I think, was the first one. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, my word is prestigious, which means having prestige. <laughs> honored quality of how good the reputation of something or uh, someone is, how fa favorably something or someone is regarded. My son Isaac is currently looking into um, graduate programs in Europe. And we were talking about, so what's the difference between a prestigious university? Mm -hmm. Like, do people care? Will that affect, you know? And we sort of thought, well, maybe it's me more when you're like, you know, in business or law or something like that. But, you know, if you're a, a, a student of cultural studies, maybe it's. But anyway, then, so that's the, the definition of prestigious because we just wanted to know what, what does that actually mean? So that's the current definition, the 20th century, 21st century definition. Prestigious, though, first appeared in the 1540s, meaning practicing illusion or magic, deceptive. From the Latin, meaning full of tricks, as in juggler's tricks. Um, it also means to blind, blindfold, dazzle, or to tie or bind. So it was considered very derogatory until the 19th century. And then it started to mean having a dazzling influence. And that then is it so now, interesting. I know. I think it's super, super interesting because we often do talk about Okay, in this, you know, what I'm referring to, universities as having this prestigious reputation. Is it all just dazzle? Is it all? <laughs> is it all just razzle, dazzle, or trickery? Mm. Anyway, prestigious. Well, shout right. out to prestidigitation for any D and D people out there. Yes. <laughs> That's the best. <laughs> and then also, there was the, that uh, the prestige uh, the movie. by Christopher Nolan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great movie. Yeah, talk about magic. Okay, because they used yeah. to like book. the yeah, prestidigitators book, yeah. of the Middle Ages were like. So there that. you go. Yeah. It all that all makes sense. There you go. <laughs> so my nerd term is <laughs> edge case. So an edge case is described by Wikipedia as a problem or situation that only occurs at extreme operating parameters. For example, a stereo speaker might noticeably distort audio when played at maximum volume, even in the absence of any other extreme setting or condition. Mm. So it's a term commonly used in engineering, uh, software design, computer engineering, 
When you're designing an object, electronic component, or computer program, it's a good practice to consider what happens when the thing being designed is used outside of its expected operating conditions. And good practice to make sure that if it fails, uh, under these conditions, that it fails gracefully. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, it's love like, that. I love that concept. I know. <laughs> I failed, yeah. but I failed gracefully. <laughs> well, if you've ever had a computer program where you've entered a piece of data and it's expecting a number and you accidentally put a comma in there and it crashed, then mm -hmm. it failed poorly. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you want it to fail gracefully and like tell you, no, no, no commas, no, no, no. please. Yeah, So absolutely. Uh, despite it being good practice, though, it's not unheard of of a programmer or designer to forget about edge cases. In some cases, edge case scenarios are enough to make a product or program fail completely. There are strategies and best practices for finding edge cases in many disciplines, but the more complicated something is, the more difficult it is to figure out where the edges are. With something as complicated as human societies, there are a huge number of parameters and so, so many potential edge cases to seek out. It's a massive undertaking to find the edges, figure out how to deal with them gracefully, but I think it's worth it. Usually, if things work okay on the margins, they work okay everywhere else, too. Oh, that's also an interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Christopher Knight is definitely an edge case. And uh -huh. uh, when you don't take care of your edges, they become cracks that people fall through. Uh -huh. And uh, if we could figure out what to do with people on, the edges, people on the edges, the people in the middle are usually fine. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have this month. Thank you so much for joining us, dear readers. For October, we're reading The Island of Sea Women by Lisa C. Thinking ahead to November, we're not sure what we want to read, so we'd like you to choose for us. There's a poll up on our Facebook group. Please have a look and let us know which of the books you would like us to read and discuss. We're on social media and we've got an email address, and if you want to use that to get in touch with us and tell us about the books we're reading, you can find our contact info at the bottom of our page at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. You can also find all our past episodes and discussion questions there, too. If you haven't already, consider subscribing to Time to Read on your favorite podcasting service and tell your book-loving friends about us, too. And until next time, make sure you find Time, time to Read. read. like go out for a beer and talk more about the about the, the, the there's book there's a lot actually. there yeah. yeah like I want to yeah. talk more about this whole concept about like why why do we have this sort of feeling of like people can't come into our 